Global Connections, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. We're talking today about the evolving implications of, of Vladimir Putin's war. And uh, it's very serious business. Let me uh, introduce our, um, Dr. Carl Ackerman. He is going to join us today to examine these implications. Hi, Carl. Hi, Jay. Always a pleasure to be with you. A pleasure to be with you, Carl. And thank you for joining us today and um, taking the time. So and here we we have uh, you know a, a perfect subject for a historian, social studies person like you, uh, to help us understand the changes. Let me read this that are being revealed. And some of them already existed um, by the invasion of Ukraine, including and I'll just list a few: the rise of Russia, if you could say it's a rise, uh, and Russian brutality, and uh, the blatant autocracy we have going on there. <clears throat> Clearly, the resurgence of the Cold War, the fragmentation of the liberal world order, it's pretty serious already, the new role of nuclear, chemical, and biological warfare, uh, and other anti, anti-personnel weapons we're seeing emerge, the deterioration, and I'm, maybe I'm projecting here, the deterioration of Western Europe uh, through the deterioration of the EU, NATO, and the United Nations, and the U.S., as peacekeepers in Europe, the global tolerance uh, for atrocities, war crimes, genocide, um, advanced high-tech and hypersonic anti-personnel weapons, the new power of high-tech internet and media propaganda, all this is emerging, um, and of disinformation and destructive hacking, and the inability of Western democracies to deal with these problems. I haven't finished. Those are only the few, you know, that are being revealed as Mr. Putin goes on, you know, and doubles down on his strange, brutal, genocidal initiatives. Um, it is really in many ways in, in Europe. It's the end of Europe as we have known it. Uh, and ultimately, it will affect the United States. So, Carl, can you can you say why this is happening? Why all of these all these things are emerging and being revealed only in the past, what, 45 days. We're, we're in, a, in a faster a transition, a, a more horrendous transformation than we've been in since World War II. Well, you know, in terms of the, the quickness and, and our being aware of all this, of course, this is the internet generation. So that's an easy answer, but... Um, uh, but your your other questions are much more complex, Jay. And let me go back to um, to something that Thomas Friedman said, and um, in a recent article a couple of days ago in the New York Times, and then um, kind of reinforce this. But um, what he said is that basically, you know, you have um, Vladimir Putin, and Vladimir Vladimir Putin is a war criminal, and so. It's very difficult. Ironically, it's more difficult to deal with Vladimir Putin now than the old Soviet leaders, because at least they had a Politburo during the Cold War. So I think that the current situation is worse than the Cold War because we're dealing with a war criminal. And it's very, it, it's very difficult to deal with a man who knows no boundaries, because even the Soviet officials knew boundaries because they were, they were a group in the collective uh, Politburo, you know? But, um, Putin is, is very different. The other thing about Vladimir Putin, I was thinking about this today, is that, you know, in many ways, this is a, re a renewal of Stalinism with, you know, Putin saying he's, you know, as, as uh, Stalin did during World War II, he restored the church, even though the Marxist Zionist dogma didn't allow for it. Um, and Putin has maintained that he's Russian Orthodox. I, I probably doubt that because, well, I don't probably, I doubt that because he was raised under the Marxist Sunnist regime and probably has no religion whatsoever uh, because of course, religion was the opium of the people according to Lenin. Um, but uh, what's interesting about uh, Putin and I always begin this, I always begin this way is that, you know, he represents a tradition in Russian history going back at least to the 19th century and probably to Peter the Great, well, most likely to Peter the Great in the 17th century that Vladimir Putin um, does not like the West. He's a Slavophile. And, you know, when he makes comments, he doesn't make comments the way the old Soviet regime did um, uh, against the United States. He talks about the West as opposed to Russian civilization. And, you know, this calls back on 19th century Russian czars, the deep notion of 
of nationalism and orthodoxy of the Russian czars. He's really uh, pulling the, the strings of Russian nationalism. And um, this is quite dangerous. So that the, the notion of internationalism or working with the West or not being fearful of NATO is out of the question because only Russian civilization can lead the world. Lead the world into oblivion. Uh, Correct. I, I haven't mentioned all the economic effects that he is having, um, you know, enhancing inflation, creating new inflation for us, um, creating um, supply line problems with uh, oil and gas all around the world. Uh, he evoked uh, all these sanctions. They, they're, they're, they, he didn't do them. It was done to him, but he evoked them. And now look at the effect that these things are having. I mean, ultimately, and there are a lot of uh, observers um, uh, indicating and finding, concluding that we'll be in a global recession or worse because of Mr. Putin. I mean, I, you know, I really don't think, uh, I, I don't know, the, you know the, the comparison with Hitler is inevitable, but I don't think any, any one single person has done as much damage to as many institutions and countries and people in, in the world as um, as Putin, and and it's only beginning. It's only beginning, and there doesn't seem to be an end to it. Uh, he is going to double down until somebody stops him. And um, so far, I don't see any way to stop him. Uh, he was quoted to, today to say, well, the sanctions don't mean anything to me. I'm going to continue my, my initiative against Ukraine and in all other ways, um, uh, despite the sanctions, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think what you know what we have here is uh, by the standard uh, evaluation a wild man a crazy man who is in control and knows how to stay in control. You know, we, the history has not seen anybody like this. Um, it's just it's it's really remarkable. And I think the one thing that uh, we ought to discuss, Carl, is that when you consider all the these things, uh, these implications that are being revealed about the world and humanity and countries and, um, you know, the liberal or not so liberal world order right now, um, they are going to affect every man, woman and child on the planet. Nobody is exempt. This one man has the, uh, the power, it's clear, to affect the entire human race. Um, thoughts about that? Am I right? Am I wrong? Uh, well, no, I think who is going to stop him and when? I, I think you're right, Jay. Let me you, going back to you, the very last comment you made about who's going to stop him and when. You know, David Remnick in the last New Yorker, um, in his notes in the beginning of the New Yorker, uh, said something really apropos to what you're just saying. He said that, you know, Putin works by personal patronage. So the people that he has surrounding him are a not going to tell him the truth if it's going badly. That that is a war, and b. Um, owe him for their wealth and their privilege. So that's, you know, you're not going to change him that way. And um, the only thing that's going to change, I think, Vladimir Putin is when Russians come home in body bags, in, in masses, and they just very may well. Um, so, you know, let's, let's, I mean, let, we don't want anyone to be killed, you know, Russian soldiers or Ukrainian soldiers, but you know, the, the reality is going to hit the Russian people. And of course, Vladimir Putin doesn't care really about the Russian people. I mean, they're going to, they're suffering already in terms of economic sanctions, but, you know, he and his oligarch friends, well, not so much as oligarch, his patronage friends, I should say, are, um, are really the ones who are, you know, uh, still gaining and, and really are not, are, are losing nothing. So that's really, that's really key. The thing, Jay, that concerns me, the most, and I'll get into the politics in just a moment, is the um, nuclear power uh, situation. Um, you know, in uh, Zaporizhia, uh, the Russians still control the largest nuclear plant in all of Europe. And we saw what they did at Chernobyl. They said to their soldiers, go dig in over there, you know, where there's nuclear soil. And so, you know, they're telling their own soldiers to do this. So imagine what's happening in that Ukrainian plant. So. That still scares me. It's been, uh, you know, at the very beginning, when you and I talked from the very beginning, I've always been very concerned about the order of the nuclear plants, because if the Russians have control, 
uh, we're in, as we what we like to say in Hawaii, deep kimchi, um, because they, you know, I mean, I, when I'm talking to students, I often say, have you ever heard of a, of, of you know, something like a Volvo or a Mercedes coming out of Russia? Of course not. They don't have good products and they don't have good quality control with the exception maybe of the space station. Even that's questionable. So, you know, this is a really, this is a dire moment for the entire world because of nuclear power and the Russians having control of the Ukrainians' nuclear power, at least at one huge uh, power plant. The second thing is that I, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Vladimir Putin has done recently is he's appointed uh, Dvornikov uh, to be, to run the show. And Dvornikov was born in 1961. And, you know, that's not pointed out by, no, by most news media. That means for 30 years, he lived in the Soviet Union, just like Putin had a long history in the Soviet Union. And, you know, he went to a, you know, I think a, a military academy uh, in, uh, in St. Petersburg. This is a, the military's man, military man, but his record both in Chechnya and in Syria is killing civilians. So this is also very dangerous. And I think, again, going back to the Thomas Friedman article, what we can do to counteract this is, number one, um, support the Ukrainians in their diplomatic processes. I think President Biden has been exquisite in terms of his no-fly zone because he doesn't want Americans and Russians shooting at each other and being very cautious. Although today he became a little bit more less cautious and called Vladimir, Vladimir Putin what he is, is a war criminal. But on, on the highest levels, that's a very strong statement. Uh, true, but strong. The mm. second thing uh, Thomas Friedman said, which I think was really good, is that when we talk to um, the Russian people, we make it clear that it's not the Russian people we're fighting against. It's Vladimir Putin only. The third thing, Jay, and I think this is maybe something uh, that you brought up with your excellent questions is, what can we do? The question is long-term all about this. And, you know, there always have been environmentalists who have said, we've got to get off our dependence on oil. And of course, with 30% of our oil coming from Russia uh, before this conflict, uh, you know, we in Hawaii, uh, have a dependence on Russian oil. Um, um, luckily, there are other places we can go to, but still 30% is, is really high before the conflict took place. So we have to go to alternative energy so that we're not dependent on Russia or any other country um, for oil production. And that's going to take probably some sacrifice among, uh, among the American people. But once it's done, we'll be less dependent internationally. And well, well, our, go our goal for that was 2045. 2045 is 20 some odd years away. Um, we don't have that much time. We do not have that much time. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the people in Europe are going to be freezing in the winter. Um, there's going to be a, a problem about uh, generating electricity in various places uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. <clears throat> we don't have that much time. And you know, you talk to the um, you know the uh, clean energy industry uh, sector here in Hawaii. They say, yeah, we can do it, but you know they have to be incentivized. Government has to step up, national government, local government, and people, of course, as you said, they have to be willing to make a sacrifice. And that is one of the very special things here. Are they willing to make a sacrifice? Do they understand the stakes? And if they don't understand the stakes and they're not willing to look at the news, you know, the news and people are complaining already that gas is costing too much. They don't link it with the, you know, with democracy and the survival of the free world and the liberal world order. Um, and this is really a mistake. Um, you know, and he has got complete control over the minds of most Russians. And that's extraordinary. And that'll continue. Um, and they'll support him even when those body bags come down, come back. That, that is my uh, expectation here. So we don't have in a freedom, you know, a democracy, we don't, we don't have that kind of mind control. And the problem is that people are going to go, I think, in the wrong direction. You want to see Congress go in the wrong? Well, when has Congress gone in the right direction since Trump and maybe before Trump? Um, you know, the, the problem is that we are going to soften in our support. And this is what I worry about, because if we soften in our support, Vladimir has exactly what he wants. And the other thing is, I mean, you know, the, these 
these changes, like some of the changes that Trump elicited among his base uh, in his four years in office, um, turn out to be permanent. They turn out to be you know, changes in society. And some of the things that have come up around Putin are likewise changes in society. Now he reaches down to a, a kind of base and, and there's, a, you know, there's an inclination to go right in Europe because of the migrant situation over the past several years. Um, there's an inclination not to care about the Ukrainians. There's an inclination not to care so much about the um, liberal world order. Look at Marie Le Pen. It's very troubling in France. And you have you know, similar proce political processes going on in Germany. If they back off the Ukraine um, protection, um, where will we be then? And I fear there's the real possibility that the changes that Putin has revealed, the implications of his, uh, I call it success, um, and it is successful. He's redefined war as no leader before, even Hitler. He's redefined war. War is mostly against ordinary human beings, people, killing people as fast and as brutally as you possibly can. This is back to, I don't know, I, I would even say they didn't do this in the 12th century. <laughs> this is so primitive. And he's doing it in full plain sight for all the world to see, and the world hasn't stopped him yet. He continues to do it. And with that new general, Carl, as you said, he will do it more. That's the problem. Well, you know, what has not been mentioned in the French press or much, or, you know, at least my analysis of it is that, well, well, it's true, Macron, you know, 26 or something like that percent, and Le Pen was like 21 or 23. I mean, there was like, I think, three percentages between them. You know, the left candidate, the socialist candidate, also had like 21 percent. So I think, you know, Le Pen was like 23, Macron was at 26. But so I'm not as worried about France as other people, because I think those leftists are not going to vote for Le Pen. Uh, let's hope they don't stay home. Um, they're going to vote for Macron. Um, and so uh, that's I think that's good news about France. I don't I, you know, I'm not as scared as I was, uh, you know, um, years ago about uh, Le Pen. And one must remember that France elected, you know, not too long ago, people like Mitterrand and, you know, sort of conservative remember like this, Carl, Jacques Chirac. Even if Macron wins, what we have seen is the emergence of a right wing in French politics. And that's not going to go away. And that right wing is a political force in a democracy that pulls Macron away from defending Ukraine. I, I, I think you're right. And I hope that um, I hope that, you know, if and when uh, Macron is uh, uh, is reelected, that he will stick with the you know, general NATO perspective. And of course, Germany, you know, a semi you know, liberal to left person was elected after Angela Merkel. So. You know, we're in good shape in, in Germany, uh, you know, I mean, and I, I'm not I'm not even so concerned. I'm not trying to put left against right, because I think that Jacques Chirac, who is more rightist in France, would have probably. Well, I think he would have supported uh, um, uh, what's being done with NATO. And it's it's uh, and I should I, I should say also that what really, uh, you know, on the other hand, we've been talking about things that are problematic, but um, on a, on, a, on a brighter note, I mean, look at how many people have been accepted by the Polish people, uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not enough, Carl. Let me, let me argue. It's not enough. And, uh, well, and you I, keep hearing them say, we, you need to you support us with money. We're running out of funds. We can't continue to do this. And over a month or two or three more, those um, complaints are going to be um, magnified. Uh, and the number of the number of, uh, of migrants or of refugees is going to be magnified. It's not necessarily going in a good direction. We can all be proud of them for now, but the direction is not necessarily encouraging. I, well, you know, I mean, it's it's difficult for any country. I mean, look at look at uh, 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 people in the United States' reaction to our southern border. I mean, it's you know, uh, and the problems we have with immigration, good or bad. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to make an editorial statement here, but I mean. I think it's difficult when you have, you know, millions of people uh, crossing your border, two million or so, four million, and um, 
that's very difficult in terms of, you know, um, in your economy. I'm not sure what the long term effect of this would be, you know, 20 years, 30 years in terms of adding to the population growth and also to, you know, um, building, you know, infrastructure, infrastructure. In, well, let's in talk that. about Ukraine itself. OK, you know, because Ukraine is clearly being devastated. Uh, the people are being killed by the tens of thousands now. Uh, Mariupol is evidence of that. Um, and brutally, and Abuka is evidence of that. Um, and the, the buildings we can see on television every day, 24 hours a day, the world can see these buildings, all the institutions, all the infrastructure being destroyed. And you can say, well, we, maybe we can put Humpty back together again. We'll go in there, we'll make investments. But the problem is the country is being destroyed. You need people, you need culture, you need the connections that make a society. And he's wrecking them. I don't know if we've ever seen this before, not in modern times. You're an historian. Maybe at some, at some point in human development before, you know, you could sack a city. That's, that was the, you know, sack a city you can make, you rubble out of it, which is what he's doing, the new kind of war. The, the problem is it is opening a possibility for other tyrants to do. And uh, it's not just him. There are people moving to the right all over the world, and they say to themselves, well, this is a new definition of war, a new definition of brutality, of using weapons of mass destruction. Let's all do it. This is the way we deal with the neighbors who trouble us. And then you have the end of the liberal world order. You have an illiberal world order. And he is inventing that for us. I, I think that Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin's trying to. I, I think the response um, on the part of the West and on part of the you know heroic Ukraine fighters, um, and you, uh, by the way, Ukraine is not perfect, and there were problems with corruption before this all started. So I don't want to paint you know a, a completely rosy picture, although it's hard not to think of you know the president President Zelensky as being you know um, extraordinarily heroic. Um, and I think that that's the way he should be um, thought of. But I, I think, Jay, that, um, that the response actually may have a limiting factor um, on, you know, China's uh, uh, um, wants uh, of, of Taiwan. And, um, you know, that the North Korean uh, um, uh, dictator and other dictators around the world um, are... Um, looking at the situation and saying, oh, my goodness, you know, this is Russia, one of the most powerful countries on the earth, and they're having problems um, with the Ukraine. And I think, you know, people have, you know, asked me in the past, you know, why did um, uh, Vladimir Putin so misunderstand what was going to happen? And I, I, you know, he was using the Czechos Czechoslovakia 1968, um, uh, Hungary 1956 uh, playbook. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't realize that people who have tasted democracy and tasted the free economy, um, you know, they don't want to go back because they realize that, you know, controlled economies and, you know, countries that don't allow um, freedom of expression uh, don't normally prosper very much. And um, what's interesting to me is that even if you talk like about a Marxist Leninist country like um, China, you know, one of the things that China has done is, you know, freed up the marketplace. I mean, the politics are still totalitarian, but they freed up the marketplace. And so that's why China is thriving. I mean, you have all these independent entrepreneurs doing business. So um, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't think it's entirely as bleak as um, one might think. Uh, there are, are terrific, you know, there are problems, but let me go back to the United States for a second, because here's my analysis, which differs from most people on the block. Um, and that is, while we had January 6th, while there has been, you know, um, you know, Tucker Carlson and, and people from Fox News who have been, um, you know, uber conservative, um, I think that a lot of Americans, even those who voted for Trump or may have thought that our elections were, you um, not good have been sold a bill of goods but they still believe in the constitution and the reason they're fighting is because they think that something was done immorally about the election so they still believe in elections they just didn't think it was a fair election because they've been fed this information by um 
uh, sources on the internet and sources at Fox that are basically telling lies. Yeah, but it's inherent all... inherent in their belief in that regard uh, is is um, is the elevation of Trump himself. If they believe there was something wrong with the election, they believe he should still be president, that he is a very good president, kind of, you know. And, and I think well, there's a lot of people in this country are still wedded to that idea. Well, we will see, we will see um, in the next presidential election, but I think, you know, um, a lot of independents aren't comfortable still with Trump. And, you know, I think if he ran again as a Republican candidate, he's gonna get beat. Um, you know, especially if he's facing Biden again, I think he's going to get beat, even with inflation. Um, but here's something that happened the other day in the Senate. Uh, the senator from Missouri is named um, Josh Holloway. Isn't that something like this? Holly. Josh, Josh Holloway. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Josh Holloway. Well, um, our senator from Hawaii, Brian Schatz, took him to task. And uh, I took him to task about the Ukraine and said, you know, you weren't for this initially, and nor was Trump. Um, and uh, speaking of Donald Trump, you know, anyone who wants to vote for him should think about his foreign policy. He got Vladimir Putin completely wrong. And, uh, you know, I mean, in other words, this is, you know, as the world knows now, this is this this man is a war criminal who is someone who believes in um, absolute power and believes that he can bully other people in, in regaining territory. And so um, and by killing people and by killing civilians and by killing his own people in terms of Russian troops. So uh, I, I think that um, Brian Schatz in the, on the Senate floor said, hey, this guy wasn't originally for the, for the Ukraine. And apparently this, uh, this senator from Missouri was trying to say, oh, we should be giving them more when, if, when at first he was against, the, against giving uh, the Ukraine weapons and things like this. So I think if we have more people, both Republican and Democrats, calling out the far right people um, in the United States and, and debating them and saying, you know, what, what is this all about? And uh, not only just on, on, on political issues like the Ukraine, but allowing people to love who they want to love um, in terms of um, gay and lesbian rights and, you know, people, um, you know, cross gender and things like this. I think these are all issues. We have that so have many to, issues. We have so many issues that have to be that have to be challenged. And of course, the Ukraine, I, I, in some ways, I think the Ukraine has made people more democratic, more wanting to support. You know, you don't bump into many people in the United States, uh, even on Fox, who want to support uh, Vladimir Putin. And so uh, this is a change. And so the, the, the I think as President Zelensky has said, he's inspiring people across the world to rethink their democratic principles. So that's the good news, Jay. Uh, well, I, I wish I could be as optimistic as you are. I, 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 I don't think we have time. Uh, people are dying by the thousands every day. The country is being wrecked. And in, in the wreckage of the country, in the devolution of the country to rubble, um, what is happening is our, our morality, uh, our liberal world order is being changed. And uh, despots all over the world are seeing... Putin's success, and it is, it is appealing to the flaws in humanity. And the question is, and I put this question to you, how is this going to wind up? Um, you have so many factors working at the same time. And then when I see, you know, for example, that ridiculous um, confirmation process of Ketanji uh, Jackson um, the, other, the other day, I say, this is how Americans spend their time um, on race, on racism, uh, don't we have more important things to do? The world is burning, as you know. You were in the program. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> you know, liberal issues. The world well, is burning, and they're and they're playing with issues that are simply inconsequential. Um, you know that, that are that are wrong direction. And so I worry about the American government. I worry about the American people. I worry about Western Europe and its ability to protect the liberal, you know, world order. And I worry that, that Putin is doubling down every day, not going away. He's continuing to do this. He's controlling the minds of the people in his country. Uh, he's using every mm, brutal weapon at his disposal. Do we have the time? Uh, shouldn't we be focusing on protecting the world order instead? This is a crisis. And I, and I, I, I grant you there are things happening in this country that may be encouraging in some ways. But can we 
attend to the global issues? Um, can we um, focus on, on protecting the, the liberal world democracy? Or are we going to get all caught up in this kind of Trump argument that we've been having? And, and I worry a lot about that. Well, you know, going back to your um, first statements here, Jay, you know, I mean, uh, the Supreme Court justice, that wonderful woman, is, has been confirmed. And uh, while you did have people like Lindsey Graham just being ridiculous, as he had already approved her once, so either he was, either he, you know, he um, hadn't done his homework in the, in the previous confirmation or he was grandstanding. I think it's the latter. And, um, you know, you can listen to him, but, you know, you should listen more to, I, I, mean, I think people in general should listen more to people like Cory Booker, who, you know, talked about what it meant to have an African-American woman um, nominated and then confirmed um, uh, for, the, for the Supreme Court. And that, My point that, is, this is such a ridiculous uh, debate. Um, yeah, well, haven't we gotten over slavery and racism already? Do we have the time and opportunity in a transformational world to have to deal with these silly, silly arguments by Hawley and the like, these silly Trump arguments when, you know, it's burning? And, and I, you know, I worry that we are not going to be able to handle world leadership. We can't be the city on the hill. We are no longer a place to which everyone wants to go for freedom and democracy. This is what I worry about. And, and Trump has set these things in motion. You can track so many of them to him. And you can track Putin to him. He unleashed Putin in so many ways. And well, now, now we don't address it. We should be addressing it on all fours. Well, I, I, you know, I agree with you. The overall picture is that uh, we have had a recent upsurge in you know, right-wing politics. But um, I, I also think that um, there are some geopolitical things going on here too. And, you know, when we had our burning issues, uh, wonderful symposium with just, you know, really eloquent and thoughtful people on there, you may remember that the uh, woman who represented India said, look, we're gonna have hands off this situation from an Indian perspective because Russia and India have been close allies in terms of economic development. and we can't afford to do that. And I, I understand that geopolitical position. I, you know, I don't agree with it, uh, but I, I understand it. And so, and there were, you know, African nations also that had received, um, uh, you know, support from um, Russia in the past and when, from, the, from the former Soviet Union and they, they abstained. But, you know, I, I think that where you and I, Jay, are coming from is also, you know, at what point do you take a moral position? I mean, at what point do you stop appeasing um, uh, people like uh, Vladimir Putin. And, you know, I mean, I think um, our president, uh, Joe Biden, has uh, started to do this. And uh, I would I would take another I would take another um, attack also, both on the right and on the left, is that sometimes our news media gets focused on, you know, Joe Biden's son or Jared Kushner and their business deals and things like that. And I I, you know, um, uh, Jared Kushner recently has been in the news because of his deals with Saudi Arabia and his investment company. And I, I think that's really of, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th degree importance. Um, what are the most important things is saving the Ukraine and um, getting people through the, 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 you know, our houses of Congress who are being confirmed by the Senate in terms of good people. And I think to a certain extent, both on the left and the right, I'm not going to you know, bash either one of them today, but I, you know, of course, the right wing has been doing some pretty uh, atrocious things recently, um, as in, as I use the example of Lindsey Graham, and you know, Lindsey Graham should be better than that. I, you know, it's just, you know, his his comments during the hearing. I mean, there's no excuse for it. He was just being childish and and uh, um, grandstanding. But well, it's a test I, of democracy, isn't it? Right. Well, uh, here's the thing, of, and we we need to get our act together. Here's um, the thing. It used to be. And I, I'd like to go back to these times um, when, you know, a president nominated someone for the Supreme Court. Um, they may have different views than someone on the left or on the right. But if they if their jurisprudence is decent and they haven't done something really awful in their lives and, you know, you shouldn't go back to their their childhood and say, oh, they threw up when they were five. Well, that's ridiculous. They should be approved. The president has the right to. I'm to afraid nominate. those days are over, Carl. 
Uh, you know, I, well, I'm hoping we can get back to that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm an eternal optimist, Jay, but, I, but let's go back to the Ukraine for a moment. And I just think, you know, seeing these Ukrainian people in this, you know, today there's a report on this like 75 year old grandfather, you know, helping to push back the Russians, you know, and it's, you know, unfortunately for the Russians, you know, uh, the Russians are always, uh, you know, alluding to and, and Vladimir Putin to the to the um, to World War II, and you know they will again on May 9th, but uh, you know Victory Day for them and and for the world. Um, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, that the, the Russians are the Nazis now, and so they are committing the same sort of crimes that the Nazis committed against them, and it's it's tragic. And I, I want to my final comment to you, Jay, unless we have more time, and I would love to talk more. But my final comment to you is, um, lucky enough, or for me, my father was one of those airmen that flew into every theater of World War II, including flying, he had clearance to fly over the Soviet Union. And what happened was that the, when the Germans bombed, they would bomb buildings and leave the infrastructure up so that they had to tear it down and then rebuild. But the good news for all of this is that the Soviets did rebuild, the Japanese did rebuild, the Germans did rebuild. And, you know, in terms of the Japanese and the Germans, they're thriving um, economies, they're you know doing well, and um, both countries, you know, for, as far as I could see, are, are committed to peace. And I think um, Prime Minister Merkel was the was the one that was most accepting of immigrants that were non-white immigrants and coming into Germany, despite the fact that she received a lot of heat for that. And I, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of really quite uh, decent people left in the world, and we're watching the Ukrainians. Um, you know, as as you might say from the you know from the World War II, fight the fight the good fight, and um, you know it's 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 demoralizing getting up and turning on the television and seeing you know Ukrainians dying every day, um, but they are fighting back and they're being very successful. And as going back, I'm going to start. I'm going to end where I began. What Thomas Friedman said is we have to continue to support the Ukrainians not only by giving them weapons but to support their diplomatic. Um, measures because they're an independent country. Thank you, Carl. Carl Ackerman, a historian, uh, a teacher at Punahou School for a lifetime, uh, joining us as he has on a number of programs to try to examine this um, transformational course that we're on right now. And we'll be back uh, with more and, and we'll see how it evolves. And we'll see if his, just, his, his uh, optimism is justified. We'll see, Carl. Okay, Jay, I just want to say you continue to be, in my book, uh, uh, the world's, uh, one of the world's greatest uh, mensch. And for those of you who don't know that word, it means a really good person. <laughs> the same to you, Carl. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Aloha. You. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.